Hi everyone, my name's Laura Clark and I'm going to be talking a little bit about a study that I conducted in 2017 with Dr Julie Vandenind at Victoria University, exploring Australian singer-songwriters' perceptions and experiences of work stress. Why singer-songwriters? Uh, I am one, so I had personal interest and experience in this area. Also in listening to the songs of singer-songwriters, we often hear personal vulnerabilities and emotional wounds. The work is also often described as isolating, self-absorbed and lonely. And despite these vulnerabilities, a dearth of research explores singer-songwriters' work stress and well-being. There is some but very limited research investigating musicians and singers' work stress, um, which reveals low income, irregular work hours, mental health issues, suicidality, problematic drug and alcohol use, sleep disorders, a lack of social support and more. So my feeling was that findings for musicians and singers may give some insight into singer-songwriters' experiences. However, I also wondered if singer-songwriters would have experiences that were unique to them, different to those of musicians and singers. <clears throat> So it was an exploratory study that we conducted in 2017. It was a qualitative phenomenological study interviewing seven Australian singer songwriters. The data was then thematically analysed and initial coding showed that there were some similarities with musicians and singers, but that there were also differences. So there were also experiences that were unique to singer songwriters. Initial coding also indicated that the data may be well explained and organised using the job demands resources model. So this is a model commonly utilised by the World Health Organisation and other Australian regulatory bodies to assess workplace stress. It's a theoretical framework that focuses on positive and negative indicators of employee wellbeing and basically assumes that all occupations across all different contexts have specific job related stress factors and that these can be categorised as either job demands or job resources. So this is a brief overview of the job demands resources model. So job demands can be mental, emotional or physical and this leads to reduced health and energy which can have negative outcomes such as exhaustion, job strain and burnout. Job resources uh, include things like feeling like one has autonomy in their role, getting good support and feedback. So this, this increases motivation for work and it also acts as a buffering mechanism against these possible negative outcomes. In 2015, Parker adapted the job demands resources model for musicians and found that musicians reported a high workload, interpersonal conflict and job insecure, insecurity and career uncertainty as job demands and that these led to psychological stress. Musicians also reported job resources, including autonomy and social support though very limited resources and that they also utilised coping strategies. So problem focused coping, positive reappraisal and support seeking. And these acted as a buffering mechanism to potential negative outcomes. The outcomes that Parker found for musicians were life satisfaction, but also high levels of psychological distress, problematic drinking behaviour, burnout and high intentions to leave the industry. When considering the data we collected from singer songwriters, there were some similarities. So there were similar job demands. Um, singer songwriters also reported some similar resources and coping strategies and some similar outcomes. But there were things described for musicians in the literature that weren't apparent for singer songwriters and also experiences that singer songwriters described that were unique to them and not described in the literature for musicians. So having a look at the data that was collected for singer songwriters. So singer songwriters describe really high job demands and high workload, similar to musicians being one of these. So feeling like it's all encompassing and it takes up your entire life. The subcategories here that came out in the data were illegitimate tasks. So these are work tasks not associated with the core of an individual's professional identity or occupation, and they're associated with increased work stress. 
for singer songwriters, these were things like marketing, administration, promotion, bookings, social media, um, and just a sense of feeling like they were doing more admin than, than creative tasks. Also working two jobs, which were similar for musicians. So feeling like they didn't earn enough money from their singer songwriter work. Uh, so having to have a second job and also stress came from trying to coordinate jobs versus gigs, depending on what was going to pay more. Irregular work hours also caused a lot of stress. So feeling like they had to be available 24 seven. So again, this was something that hasn't been reported in the literature for musicians. So it seems to be unique to singer songwriters and a sense that having to gig and tour as well as booking, marketing, emails, phone calls, um, just a general sense that they needed to be available for their singer songwriter work um, at all hours. Working nights and weekends, similar to musicians, um, was a high job demand that caused a lot of stress and had, had a rolling on impact, such as um, social disconnection and sleep uh, disruption, as we'll see later on. Similar to musicians, singer-songwriters reported job insecurity and uncertainty. Um, so uncertainty around career progression and also uncertainty around sales and income, uh, also around performances. Uh, and just kind of feeling like there's a lot of luck involved and that no matter how hard you work, at the end of the day, it's a bit of a lottery. Financial strain was also a job demand um, that caused stress for singer-songwriters. And so low income, this is similar to musicians, just generally feeling like they weren't paid enough for what they do. But something unique to singer-songwriters was that they also um, reported high outgoing costs. So things like insurance, equipment, recording, venue hire, posters and promotions, paying for the sound engineer. Um, and one of the participants, I think, summed up the financial strain for singer-songwriters beautifully when she sought to clarify one of the demographic questions. And she asked me, um, so say if you earn $50,000 a year and then you spend $40,000 a year on your music, are you earning $10,000 a year or are you earning $50,000 a year? And I just thought that's a beautiful summary of the, the low income and the high outgoing costs, which means ultimately a really low income. Singer songwriters also reported a toxic work culture. So just feeling like the industry is pretty ruthless and brutal. And sub themes here were competition and jealousy. Uh, so just envying others success and also this sense that it's really hard to get anywhere and achieve anything. So when you are achieving something, you kind of want to protect that and protect your slice of the pie. Um, and that you're also fighting against peers for a slice of that pie. So for example, festival spots and particular gigs. The female singer songwriters that we uh, interviewed did describe discrimination and this was gender discrimination. So intimidation, comments like you play guitar good for a girl uh, and one of the singer songwriters actually um, told a story about a colleague who was not getting a lot of gigs booked under her own name. So she uh, created a fake male manager to email about bookings and bookings increased. So there was definitely some gender discrimination noticed. Working in isolation was something that was unique to singer songwriters and not reported in the literature for musician. So just feeling like uh, even if they're working with a band, it's still their name and reputation. Uh, so kind of feeling like you're out there on your own and also that there was a generally a lack of industry support. Another unique job demand for singer songwriters was personal vulnerability. So putting their experiences and vulnerabilities out there to be judged and just feeling like it's this raw part of you that you're just bearing your soul to other people. And this made them feel quite vulnerable. Singer songwriters did report job resources as well. So despite competition and jealousy, there was a lot of peer support reported. So just that general sense that if you put two songwriters in a room, they're going to talk about how hard it is and what they're doing to get through. So there was this sense of people who have done it get it and they're kind of the only people who understand what I'm going through. We're in the same boat. And this camaraderie of, of every success is a success for us all. So this really great peer support, despite the competition and jealousy. 
and then intrinsic rewards of just doing the work as a singer songwriter so never waking up and dreading having to go to work and the subcategories here were human connection so just feeling like they could make a difference connecting with the crowd and that sense of when the crowd is connected with them really living for that feeling and then just the general joy of being a songwriter it's just something they wanted to do they get pure enjoyment um, from all the aspects, so performing, traveling, socializing, um, just really a love of what they do. So these were similar for musicians. Something unique for singer-songwriters was this use of songwriting as a kind of self-therapy. So uh, yes, they're the ones who do it all and it's very isolating, but at the same time, they're the ones who get to write the songs and the lyrics. So being able to express themselves and also feeling as though they expressed things that they might not otherwise be able to express um, and that this has actually helped them through mental health challenges. Uh, so other coping tools that were utilised by singer-songwriters, so some had good personal support and just feeling like being with family and friends was essential. So one described this as paramount importance um, in their work as a singer-songwriter, so having friends and family. Um, a couple had a psychologist or other professional support and there was this sense from a couple of the singer-songwriters that there's no support anywhere else. So without this personal support, I would probably just give up. Um, interestingly, others noted that their support was um, all peer-based and that they didn't have personal support and that this was something they really struggled with. Similar to musicians, singer-songwriters also uh, utilised positive reappraisal. So trying to turn things into a positive, trying to adjust their attitude. Um, and there was kind of this broad theme of redefining what success looks like. And I think this quote from one of the participants really sums it up in just exactly how much they need to reappraise or readjust what success means. So um, I could be more successful, I could be more known, I could sell more records, but I'm not dead. So this is kind of the benchmark of if, if I'm alive, I'm okay. And then anything on, on top of that is a bonus. So I feel like that's pretty um, explanatory of that. So what are the outcomes if we think about singer-songwriters having high job demands, low resources and limited coping tools? So there were a lot of mental health issues reported. Um, so depression of differing severity, some had a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, um, others just noticed that their mood um, would change and that sometimes they would feel down. Anxiety was also um, reported, the second most reported um, experience from the singer-songwriters and also body image and eating disorder concerns came up as well. All the singer-songwriters said that their mental health was linked to their creative work. So if things were going good with music, they felt good. Um, and then another, another participant noted that it's hard to look after yourself because of the demands of the job. So having to be available 24 seven, having sleep deprivation, limited finances to be able to pay for things that are going to be helpful with mental health um, impacted the ability to, to have that care for yourself. Another theme that came up was low self-worth. So one of the singer-songwriters noted that they really allowed music to feel, to make them feel unworthy. And also that the envy of others came from this lack of their own self-worth. Um, and then as mentioned earlier, sleep disorders. So working weekends and working late at nights um, and just working 24 seven meant that sleep was disrupted or there just wasn't enough sleep. Um, and one of the singer songwriters noted, yes, that there is sleep deprivation and I just put up with it because it's worth it. So that's a snapshot of the job demands resources model adapted for singer songwriters with the main categories. So high job demands, low job resources, some coping tools, and that these were motivating factors or acted as a buffering mechanism. Um, but without these, there were mental health problems, low self-worth and sleep disorders were really common. So the recommendations from this study were that singer-songwriters be categorised separately in future studies and not grouped with musicians given their unique experiences and that future research tests the validity of the job demands resources model, which I've adapted for singer-songwriters. 
Uh, we also recommend that specialist support services be made available and in particular a national helpline phone number. So something like Lifeline, a 24-7 number for um, musicians and singer-songwriters that they could call for support. And I'm really happy to note that since this study, so in 2018, this was actually established, the Support Act Wellbeing Helpline, which is still going strong and is now available to all individuals who work in the entertainment industry so it's just we're really lucky via support act and the arts wellbeing collective have really put in a lot of hard work to start establishing some of these specialist support services and we're so lucky they're they're doing an amazing job and we're seeing some really fantastic resources come out also trained counselors and psychologists who have an interest or experience in working in this area and it's really great to know that there is growing interest in this. So there's peer supervision happening at the moment. Organisations such as the Australian Society for Performing Arts Healthcare are seeing more mental health professionals get involved. So there, there is some interest growing here, which is great. Increased industry support would be a must. This is really difficult in a time of coronavirus, so I won't go too much into that, um, but, but will be certainly a necessity as the industry rebuilds and also changes to music education curriculum. And what I really mean by that is for young singer songwriters and musicians to start to educate them that these are the demands that, that will, will be placed on you if you get into this work. Um, so a lot of them, the workload, the work hours, the insecurity and uncertainty, working in isolation vulnerability, like these demands are not gonna go away for singer songwriters. So it's less about trying to change some of these things and more about building in education about this type of stuff into into curriculum and then to help young and new musicians and singer songwriters really build up these resources and these coping tools so they have the best shot at having this buffering mechanism and this motivation that's going to help to kind of outweigh some of those demands that exist And I just wanted to finish on this quote from one of the participants who I thought really summed up beautifully the, the, the roles and the expectations as a singer songwriter. So you're expected to wear all these different hats. Um, being a songwriter is just one part of it. You have to be a performer, a socialite, a marketing expert, a web designer, a clandestine vandal putting up posters in the middle of the night. Um, so you have to be all these things simultaneously and perfectly to get the whole package together to cut through. And even then, even if you get all of those things right, you still need luck on top of it to get you over the line. So thanks so much for uh, listening to my presentation and I hope there have been some helpful things and some insight that comes from that. And um, if anybody would like to get in touch, that, that is my contact email address. Thanks so much. Okay, well, hello everybody, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be presenting this today, this work that I've been doing related to the mental health of performing artists uh, in Australia, uh, something that we don't know a huge lot about. In fact, uh, all over the world, there is a real limited amount of research about the mental health of performing artists. There's some work around uh, dancers, and that's often very specific to body image and eating disorders. There's some use around substance use in particularly musicians, but as a whole, there is a lack of overall research about um, mental health uh, in performing artists and particularly uh, in Australia. Um, and so it's a great pleasure to present some of the work uh, that uh, myself and some colleagues have been doing uh, in relation uh, to this. So, I'm uh, from Victoria University um, and uh, I'm today going to be presenting some of this work that is uh, a collaboration, as I'll explain uh, in just a moment. Um, I'm going to talk today around the, uh, some work, some quantitative work that I've been doing in relation to this space uh, around mental health of performing artists. This was um, a collaboration between uh, Victoria University and uh, Entertainment Assist, and Entertainment Assist are an organisation uh, based in Melbourne who uh, but, but, uh, work nationally, um, but who have as their mission a um, desire to and an aim to 
protect and preserve the mental health of those people who work in the entertainment industry. And so Victoria University and Entertainment Assist collaborated on this study, um, of which I'm presenting part of the results. But overall, the study was a, a large quantitative study of um, 2,407 people uh, who worked in the entertainment industry. And within that, there were three groups of, um, of people. Uh, there were group one, the performing artists. Uh, those are actually on stage and, and um, performing in front of audiences. Uh, group two were performing arts support workers, so people, producers, directors, um, mu musical directors, that, those kinds of, of people. And then group three were the technical support workers, you know, lighting technicians, um, audio technicians, and so on. And so we had um, three groups, and today I'm just presenting some of the work from group one. So I'm not going to talk about some of the findings from the other two groups. Uh, my work is focused primarily on uh, the, the first group. Um, and I'm actually going to be talking about something of a subset uh, of that group because performing artists was very broad, included um, singers, dancers, actors. Um, but it also included uh, circus performers, magicians, um, you know, children's birthday performers. Um, so I'm focusing purely on, as I'll talk about in just a moment, um, people who are, are singers, dancers, actors, uh, and musicians. So just quickly, I'll talk about um, some of my uh, uh, method. Um, I had, uh, so my subset included just over 1,000 participants. Um, and um, you can see there that the majority were female. Um, and I looked specifically at actors, dancers, singers, and musicians. And you can see there, the sort of breakdown. Um, most of the people up were, were dancers um, and uh, singers were, were the lower number. But it is important to acknowledge that some people might have done some of the work in, in all of these or, or, or a number of these things. So there might have been an actor who also did singing or a dancer who also was an actor. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, it's important to, to understand that. And what we did is we administered a range of uh, different measures there, um, primarily around mental health. And so you can see there that we looked at anxiety and depression through um, the hospital anxiety and depression scale. We also looked at um, health-related quality of life, and so um, looking at the, the impact of, of this on their, their quality of life, and this yields a score of a, a physical health-related quality of life and a mental health-related quality of life. We looked at social support um, through the multi-dimensional scale of social support, which yields um, a score from social support from friends in the industry, family, and um, significant other. We looked at um, this, uh, a level of suicidality through opaque or suicide feelings in the general population questionnaire, and then some other demographic um, variables, including income, substance use, um, and also whether they had a mental health diagnosis in the past. And all of these things will become important as I talk about some of the results. I'll say from the outset that these variables were all highly correlated. Don't have the um, opportunity to be able to go into those correlations uh, in this forum, the time limits, but they were, uh, they were all highly correlated. I want to move now to looking at um, some of the results and I'll talk more broadly about the results of depression and anxiety and then some of the, the statistics that um, I've run to, to look into that a little bit more specifically. Um, the hospital anxiety and depression scale yields two scores, a score for anxiety and a score for depression. And we can see here that uh, this is where the means uh, of each of those fell into um, the, within those areas. Um, and I've got as a means of comparison some more recent normative data, reasonably recent normative data uh, using this measure. And you can just see from there that um, the rates are higher in both instances for anxiety and depression than this normative data. Um, uh, the, the anxiety score was uh, within the range that's um, uh, borderline extreme. The depression score was at the upper end of what's within the normal range, but nevertheless, they're both significantly higher. If 
I talk more specifically about depression, um, what I have done is looked at um, factors that might contribute to this. Um, and so, just to reiterate, the, the levels of depression were significantly higher. And then when we ran some analyses, some regression analyses, we found that, and, and included in that, um, social support, um, quality of life, um, alcohol consumption and industry income, that these significantly predicted um, the levels of depression um, uh, with, a, with, a, with a highly significant result there. When we looked at some of the individual um, predictors of depression, you can see here that uh, a number of them were, were significant, particularly quality of life, physical health related quality of life is what the PHC uh, represents and mental health related quality of life, which is um, what MHC were both highly significant. Social support from family was a significant predictor of depression. Obviously, we can see there that the, the D level is, is in the negative um, and also whether they engaged in, um, in risky drinking, uh, single use um, alcohol consumption was a significant predictor. The, the story was similar in relation to anxiety. The anxiety levels were significantly higher. Um, and also the regression analysis um, uh, that um, what was significant as well, that social support, quality of life, income and um, risky drinking behaviour was a significant, a highly significant predictor of uh, anxiety levels. It was something of a different story when it came to the individual predictors. Um, and as you can see here, social support didn't come up uh, at all. Significant other did sort of trend towards, but, but is not significant. But the two quality of life measures were significant predictors uh, of anxiety uh, in the population. And this very much looks at um, how might have the individual's quality of life been impacted, whether it be physical health or mental health, uh, as a result of, of, uh, of their difficulties. Um, I also looked at substance use, and uh, this looked at um, the frequency of single occasion risky drinking behaviour, which is defined as um, drinking more than four standard drinks uh, once a month or more. And um, I've got here uh, whether they did fall into this or whether they, they did not. And so I broke it down into a yes or a no uh, based on the, the responses. And you can see here that 75% uh, of the sample did indicate that they engaged in um, single, uh, risk, single occasion risky drinking behaviour, 75%. Um, and compared to the normative data using the exact same measure, you can see that there's almost um, an inverse. So in, in normative data, about 27%, just over 27% engaged in risky drinking behaviour and 73% just under did not and it's almost the opposite here. So there's a real significant difference in this sample in their risky drinking behaviour than, than uh, the normative data. Um, I also ran some analyses to have a look at some of the factors that might contribute to this. And surprisingly, neither of the mental health uh, measures of anxiety or depression were significant predictors. Um, all of them combined were, it was a significant um, regression equation, um, but uh, the only one individual predictor was that of social support from others, which is an interesting thing, um, indicating that perhaps it's a real social part of being in this industry to engage in, in that kind of um, drinking behaviour. The, the last thing that I'm going to talk about is, is the levels of suicidality. And these were quite significant. Uh, as I'll outline, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, looking at these and as trying to understand these. Um, the measure that was used here, uh, the Pacal Suicidal Scale, um, has five items and they assess um, areas of suicidal uh, ideation, uh, suicide planning and suicide attempts and uh, people are answer questions uh, in, in relation to all of those areas. There's five items in the questionnaire and uh, the, the, the respondents were asked whether they had had thoughts of suicide, whether they'd made plans of taking their life and whether they had done so in their lifetime. And just uh, 
uh, in this first column here under the current study, you can really see here the um, proportion of the sample that endorsed particular items. And so only one person in the sample didn't endorse or didn't answer positively to, um, to any items at all. 70% of the sample indicated that they'd had thoughts that their life was not worth living. About 60% said that they uh, wished that they were dead. Um, and then similarly, kind of high 60s, 70% almost had thoughts of taking their own life, had made plans, thoughts to make, uh, uh, around suicide planning. And 13% uh, indicated that they had made a suicide attempt in their lifetime. Now this compares to, if we look at Australian statistics, uh, the estimation is around 3% um, uh, make an attempt of their life. So 13% is, is such a high number. A similar, um, the, 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 uh, a study used the same measure um, in 2016 and the, the differences are stark between this sample and the sample that was used here, which interestingly was a sample of uh, veterans who typically have higher suicidal ideation and suicide attempts than the general population. But you can see here the big difference between the, the samples. And so in this sample, 65%, uh, so almost two thirds of that sample, didn't answer positively to any items, as opposed to only one person in this sample, 4.2 of the, of, of the sample. The differences are, are, are stark. And then if we look at suicide attempts, only 1.6% of that sample indicated that they had attempted uh, to take their own lives, as opposed to, as I say, the 13% in this sample. Um, I also broke this down into levels of suicidality. Uh, whether there was no su suicidality, low or high, and this was a um, an approach that was also used in this sample uh, in this work as well, um, and uh, and you can see there the the similar differences, and this was significant. And so high sixty five two thirds of this sample almost it indicated or demonstrated um, responses that demonstrated a high level of suicidality, as opposed to. 24% uh, in this other sample. And the difference between these two uh, were significant, as you can see there. Looking at some of the predictors here, um, certainly um, we found that um, depression and anxiety, the combination of depression and anxiety, a, a lifetime mental health diagnosis, quality of life and su social support was significant in its contribution to suicidality. And when we looked at some of the individual predictors, if someone had had a mental health diagnosis, that was the most significant predictor of suicidality. Anxiety was also a significant predictor, as was social support from family and friends, and also mental health um, composite, um, mental health related quality of life, as we can see uh, down the bottom here. Interestingly not enough, depression was not a significant predictor of suicidality, and that's quite a surprising finding. And so I've looked within this to see whether or not perhaps the relationship between depression and suicide um, might be um, moderated um, by, um, by, by some um, other factors. And, and we certainly found that um, the, the relationship between depression um, and suicide was mediated um, by um, social support from, from one's family. So someone had social support from the family, it did mediate the relationship between those two variables. And similarly, the relationship between depression and, uh, depression and suicidality, it was uh, mediated by um, social support from friends. And so these are really important things when we're working with this population that um, if somebody does not have strong levels of social support uh, from their friends or strong levels of social support from their family, they could potentially be at a higher risk uh, of suicide, particularly if they have strong levels um, of depression. So this tells a really telling story uh, of this population. Um, this tells a very telling story 
of the, the challenges that this population has, where there are significantly higher levels of anxiety and depression, that this has um, a significant impact on individuals' quality of life, uh, both mental health related quality of life and physical health related quality of life, and that they do engage in risky drinking, single use drinking uh, behaviour. This is significantly higher than, than the norms, and that this perhaps could be um, linked to um, socialising uh, within the industry. I think it really points to that this is an at risk population. And it's very important that we understand working within this at-risk uh, population and that we understand that levels of social support, the importance of, of understanding social support and helping to strengthen areas of social support is so fundamental within um, this population. So there's a quick snapshot. Um, thank you for listening and I hope that that uh, sheds some light on this uh, particularly interesting population. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Tristan Fraser. I'll be speaking about factors specific to the well-being of artists of culturally and linguistically diverse background here in Australia. I'll talk about some research that I did under the supervision of Dr. Julie van der Nijnd, who's one of the authors of the Entertainment Assist research that we've spoken about. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which I present and from which those of you in Australia are viewing. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I feel very fortunate to live among a diversity of cultures here in Australia. And I believe that the arts is not only a beautiful way to connect with this diversity, but it's an essential way for people to experience this cultural diversity. Unfortunately, there's barriers to participation for culturally diverse artists here. Diversity Arts Australia released a report late last year revealing really poor representation of cultural diversity at leadership levels in the cultural organisations in Australia. And that representation is evident also among the artist population in general. And unfortunately, artists of non-English speaking background are paid very poorly in comparison to other artists who are all already paid poorly. So looking at the literature, I read about culturally and linguistically diverse populations in Australia, and I read about artist populations in Australia both were vulnerable populations. There was a lack though of research about artists of culturally and linguistically diverse background. So I was interested in looking at, firstly, how do culturally diverse artists in Australia conceptualize wellbeing? And secondly, what effect on wellbeing is experienced by them as a result of their artistic practice and also their experience of acculturation and Australian culture? So I had the pleasure of interviewing 10 artists, two musicians, three dancers, a writer, singer, a visual artist, actor and performance artist. Seven participants were born overseas. Three were second generation Australians. And for the most part, I will let their voices speak for themselves. I'll interject here and there with um, my interpretation of this data. Five overarching themes emerged from an analysis of the interview data. Creating art, culture, acculturation, identity and well-being. And these sub-themes that emerged, I'll speak to a little bit more as I go through some quotes for each of the themes. Creating art 
was a theme that captured, on the one hand, the outcome of creating art was an object or a performance that contributed to culture through the interactions with audiences. But on the other hand, as a means of personal expression, creating art also had personal meaning for the artist. When you combine this with the need to earn a living, um, there were further challenges when art was a commercial product. So art was considered as a way to conserve culture. Try to keep your culture, your background. Try to make sure you bring your instrument to other cultures so they can know more about your instrument, about your story. On the other hand, though, it was also considered as a way to challenge the status quo. Essentially, the aim of all the works is to inspire conversation, self-reflection, and from there, the hope is some form of social change. Artists felt a calling, which is consistent with other literature in this area, and identified very closely with this vocation. It just seemed like it was a natural thing to do and I couldn't separate it from who I was. Many participants felt that their art was not only outside of the mainstream, but poorly supported. I'm less likely to try and apply for a grant. I probably can, but I don't feel like what I do applies to being an artist like what's classified as an artist in Australia somehow. As has been discussed in previous literature, there was often a requirement to fulfil multiple roles. Becoming a website developer, a marketing person, communications, learning how to print, just takes over your life, learning how to do all that. And of course, um, there was a lot of financial instability. Money's pretty low priority, even though I don't have much of it. But like I need money in order to learn more, in order to go to workshops, pay rent and eat, I suppose. So in the previous theme, culture was discussed in terms of how art and culture intersect. But in this theme, it was more about the environment in which the art was created issues of diversity and multiculturalism, and also the participants' experience of Australian culture and the various cultural influences on their artistic work. The term multicultural had a social context that for some felt excluded them. I don't know if that term, multicultural artist, can ever make that artist be seen as something serious because they're like token. They're off to the side. But the term multicultural wasn't perceived as negative for all participants. There are heaps of cultures, Arabic culture, Turkish culture, Albanian culture, Sudanese cultures, Italian culture. It's a multicultural area. You've got heaps of different people and they're living really happy here. A sentiment common among the second generation participants was that they didn't really belong in any culture. I think of lots of white Australians telling me that they don't have any culture. And so I'm lucky that I have some culture. And then I'm like, but I'm Australian. I mean, I'm like you. Australia was seen as a haven by some participants, especially coming here as a young child from a war-torn country I felt that Australia was a really safe place. And I think one of the best things about the culture is everyone minds their own business and no one really interferes in what you're trying to do. A thing that emerged from a few of the participants was sadness at the loss of culture over generations. Malta, it surrendered its cultural history to whoever invaded it and took it over. However, art emerged as a way to conserve that culture. 
success in that sense for me is seeing Maltese people feel proud of who they are rather than feeling diminished. So the participant was reflecting on presenting Maltese music and this being a source of pride. The acculturation theme, um, I looked at John Berry's work on acculturation strategies of um, assimilation, separation, integration and marginalisation. And it appeared that participants drew on different strategies depending on context and that it was an ongoing process. It was impacted on by the attitudes that they encountered here and that influenced their sense of identity and their overall well-being. So there are examples of assimilation. When I first came to Australia, I realised that no one was going to pay much attention to me and understanding me. For the first six months, I worked really hard on learning how to speak like an Australian, learning the culture. There are examples of integration. It took quite a while for me to be able to appreciate both cultures and to bring them together for myself as part of my whole identity. There were examples of separation. My friends were going to the shopping centre to play video games and my dad and mum didn't want me to go, so they would deploy this excuse like, that's not in our culture. There were examples of marginalisation. We were regarded as not being white enough, so up until the time that the Immigration Restriction Act was overturned in 49, Maltese people were not accepted into the country openly. Art was used as a way to cope with acculturative stress. I started designing artwork because I think I got a little bit depressed living here because I had trouble communicating with people because of the language barrier. So identity formation was a big theme. An emerging theme was the contextual and dynamic nature of identity. I do subconsciously change the way I speak according to what group I'm talking to, what cultural group. Some participants resisted being constrained by cultural mores. The way we were brought up, especially Sri Lankan, Indian parents, there's a lot of pressure. You need to be a doctor or a lawyer. I wanted to be someone that will give opportunities to other people to explore their other options. But it's okay not to go down that path. Being identified with um, a certain culture, particularly as an artist, had its pitfalls. You can't just express yourself creatively, like a Muslim artist wouldn't be able to get angry. That would be extrapolated to all Muslims or Turks or whatever. And there was a strong theme of artists finding um, the autonomy to express their identity as they wanted to. And the next quote is from a, a participant reflecting on a performance that was curated by Turkish and Syrian um, people and how it felt much better to her than the way she felt commodified as a paid entertainer among white audiences. It was a really good experience because it was on our terms. Hey, this is me and I'm not necessarily dancing for you, but I'm going to share this with you. But belonging also emerged as a theme that was important for identity, identity formation. And this next quote is from a, a participant who felt that in Australia, he was much more free to express his identity. We people look different in our hometown in Pakistan, so they can recognise us easily and they can target us easily. I couldn't play music in my hometown. So since that, when I came to Australia, it's really good for me. So conceptions of well-being were really broad. The process of creating art was considered therapeutic and facilitated mindfulness. I just focused on making artwork. I didn't really have time to worry about the future. But for many, Presenting art or performing had negative impacts on well-being. Whenever you get up on stage, you're always anxious about whether you're going to do it or not do it. 
there's conceptions of well-being like hedonic well-being which is like the balance of pleasure and pain if you like and some of the conceptions were like this when you exercise you do release the happy hormone but other conceptions of well-being are more about finding purpose or meaning in life so eudaimonic well-being and these also emerged more strongly than hedonic ideas in the past when i've given up my art practice i got really depressed i think i need to respect that i'm 99 percent sure my contribution might be as an artist and conceptions of well-being about feeling a sense of belonging and community also emerged i think the people have a sense of comfort knowing that there's others who have a common interest, common passion, and it's just the simplest of things, such as it's a social gathering as well. So they feel like it is their little community and they belong somewhere. So looking again at the questions, how do culturally and linguistically diverse artists in Australia conceptualise well-being and what effect on well-being is experienced by them as a result of their artistic practice? And their experience of acculturation and Australian culture. So for these 10 artists, we could summarise the, the main findings as follows. Creating art maintained links to cultural communities. It was important for cultural pride. It enabled sharing of stories interculturally, and it also contributed to the formation of culture. It gave a sense of purpose, a process to focus on, feelings of pleasure, a sense of belonging. So it crossed a range of ideas of well-being. Integration as an acculturation strategy and ethnic identity both were associated with well-being but so was the autonomy to create identity on one's own terms. And identity was fluid and contextual. So uh, aspects of artist identity interacted with aspects of cultural identity and cultural expectations and participants received varying information about the value of art from different parts of their social ecology. And a beautiful quote, which captures a common theme of the arts not being an occupation worthy of the sacrifice made moving here to Australia. Um, I'd love to finish with this quote. It was the Imam. Dad was having a chat to him and said, he's just stuck on writing, you know, I don't know why. And the Imam said, yeah, but you know, Writers and poets and those people play a very important role. If no one had written the Quran or these poems, he was like, what would our culture be? So due to barriers to participation, culturally and linguistically diverse artists may be more at risk of financial instability and poor mental health outcomes. But it's an incredibly resilient group, the 10 participants that I interviewed. So they were driven by the, a passion for their work and they saw creating art as a way to inform culture and facilitate social change and also um, communicate about their tradition. So we definitely need further research in this area. Most importantly, because the arts have such a great potential to foster real intercultural dialogue and this is something that's needed more and more in environment of growing cultural diversity. <laughs>